this is what I would like to uh, show you. In here, this is the uh, photograph of the debris that was seen in General Ramey's office at Carswell Air Force Base in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. This is my father holding up uh, what is very obviously parts of a uh, radar target with uh, balloon debris. In here, you see balsa wood fragments. You have actually parts of the balloon envelope in of itself. And uh, you have what looks like paperback metal foil. And to emphasize this, this is not what was seen on the floor of our kitchen that evening or that late uh, early morning hours in 1947. This is totally different. The implication is that Major Marcel may have been ordered to take part in a cover-up that involved switching the material from Roswell for a common weather balloon. General Ramey and the Air Force now discounted their earlier press announcements that they had found a flying saucer. The story was officially dead. But back in Roswell, those who had reported the original story found that the military were behaving somewhat strangely over what they now claimed was merely a weather balloon. Frank Joyce had been the first to announce the original news of the flying saucer at local radio station KGFL just a few hours earlier. I got a phone call. Well, I got a number of phone calls, but the one that really got my attention was purportedly from the Pentagon. There was a young lady on the line saying, Colonel so-and-so, uh, this is the Pentagon calling. And this was in a few minutes of it going out on the wire. And the voice on the line says, uh, who is this? I tell him. He said, you put that story on, on the air about the flying saucers? And I mean, his voice was, you know, the type that really conveys menace and power. And I said, yes, I did. And he says, you're going to get in a lot of trouble uh, for this or made some, some threatening comment. And I said, look, I'm a civilian. You can't talk to me this way. You can't treat me this way. You can't tell me what to do in stories I put on the air. <clears throat> and he says, I'll show you what I can do. And bang, hung up the phone. And the voice at the other end of the line showed exactly the power that he had to the owner of the radio station. I got a call from Washington from one of the offices of one of the senators saying, look, if you put out any stories on this, this thing, you're going to lose your license. And it's not going to be over a period of time. It's going to be the same day that we tell you that you're off the air. My name is Jerry Croft, and I'm a professor in California, a psychologist. About five years ago, I wrote that book called Extraterrestrial Contacts, The Roswell Foil, UFOs, and How They Alter Our Understanding of the Modern World. Well, since that time, I, by the way, I made a video of that, and I, something like 99,000 people watched it. And it's an academic lecture. So that's, that's a lot for an academic lecture. May not be that much for YouTube. But uh, a lot has changed in five years. Pentagon releases, new breakthroughs in archaeology, new breakthroughs in genetics, and... Um, I was going to make a second edition, then I said, no, I'm going to make uh, a new title, and it's more representative. It's uh, coming out January 2021, hot off the presses. So this is an introductory video. If you've seen the old video or read the old book, you'll see a few slides repeated, but uh, this is chock full of new stuff. So uh, stay with this, uh, because this is really bringing us up to date, and this is probably the most important question in our lives. I truly believe that. Uh, this starts with a once upon a time story. I have graduated from the University of Michigan. I have a bachelor's degree. The Vietnam War is wait, raging. Uh, the only way to avoid it is to become a school teacher or to be married and have a kid. And I became a school teacher and was taught one year. And then I taught my second year in a place called St. Mary of Wayne School. It was about 20 minutes from Ann Arbor, where Michigan is, University of Michigan. So I'm teaching. For but a little girl comes up to me and says, my daddy said I should show you this. And she brings this material. That's a photoshopped picture of what I held in my hand. It seemed like it was five by five 
silvery, a little more silvery than you see. I couldn't get it more silvery. And I thought it was aluminum foil. She said, crush it. So I crushed it up and let it go. And all of a sudden it opens up like a flower. Wow, I said, cool. She said, really try to crush it. So I crushed it down to the size of a marble. Let it go and it opens up like a flower flat on my teacher's desk. No creases, nothing. Wow. Try to cut it. I said, is that okay with your daddy for me to try to cut it? Now, this stuff is as thick as perhaps two pieces of stationery. That's how thick it is. And it's just a tiny bit elastic, not much. So I figured that would be no difficulty to cut. I pulled out scissors and I did it and it would bend, but it wouldn't cut. Took another pair of scissors, nothing. She said, try to put a hole in it. So I took a ballpoint pen. I had a metal desk. Why do I, I don't know why I remember that I had a metal desk, but I had a metal desk. And I could not put a hole in it. And then she said, then I, I thought, I'll t I've got these things that teachers have called compasses that make geometric lines. Remember those things? They have pointy metal tips. And I jammed that into the material. It just bent, did not puncture. And then when you removed it, it flattened out. I had never ever seen anything like it. But I was not even, I didn't know anything about UFOs. This is actually 17 years after, or 18 years after Roswell. I knew nothing about any of that. I thought her father worked for NASA, that it was some kind of space material that was being made for the space program. And I said, thank you very much. That was the end of that story. Now, the next part of this story is like 40 years later, 30 years later. My best friend, David Grifford, got a PhD in psych just like me, except he was a lot more extroverted than I was. And he went to see, he was interested in Jung and Velikovsky and uh, the pyramids. And he went to Easter Island twice. And uh, he also got himself a private plane. And I said, you know, man, that's kind of dangerous. He said, ah, Jerry. Well, he crashed his plane into a mountain uh, died at the age of 49, and it was very tragic. So a decade later, I was kind of, uh, I guess, getting ready for retirement, and I said, maybe I'll write a book in honor of him or dedicate it to him and look into this question that he was so preoccupied with. I wasn't. He was. So uh, in the preparation for that, I'm reading a research, okay? reading a book by a guy named Philip Corso, who was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He's 80 years old. And he's writing a book that he was at Roswell. Roswell was the only nuclear base in the country. That was where the Enola Gay was stationed, the plane that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And the UFOs were flying around for three days, 3,000 to 5,000 miles an hour. And there was a lightning storm, and one was hit by lightning and crashed. I said, okay, all right. So uh, the crash site was there. The one, two of the beings were dead. One being walked out. The Air Force shot it. I said, oh, give me a break. And then they said they took the body to Walter Reed, did an autopsy, had a big head, almond eyes, about the size of a child. Uh, no blood, only white lymphatic fluid internal organs they had never seen before, no genitals. And I said, okay, that's enough. This is just junk pseudoscience. Guy want to publish a bestseller crap. Why are you reading this? Then I read a paragraph that changed my life. And I hope you stayed with me so far because here's that paragraph. I'm going to read it very slowly. He's talking about the debris at the Roswell site. One of the materials discovered was a dull, gray, metallic, cloth-like material that seemed to shine up from the sand. The officer at the wreckage stuffed it into his fist and rolled it into a ball. Then he released it, and the metallic fabric snapped back into shape without any creases or folds. When I tried to cut it with scissors, the arms just slid off without making even a nick in the fiber. When I tried to stretch it, it bounced back. Well, I read that and I said, wait a second, wait a second. I had that material in my hands. When was that? When was that? When was that? What, where, where was I teaching? Who was that girl? Okay. 
So that's what gave birth to this book. All right. And this starts a long journey, and I hope you'll stay with me because it is really an interesting journey. So I talked to one UFO person. He said, why don't you try to find that girl? I said, I don't remember anybody that I, who were my students. They're 65 now. They were 11 then. Well, I found there was a Facebook page, and some of these people stayed in touch with each other. And that they said that there, they two two people remembered the girl passing that stuff around, <clears throat> and they said I think the girl's name was Denise Daly. Well, um, they pointed out who she was, and by the way, that's me. Okay, twenty four year twenty four year old me. Um, so how do I find Denise Daly? Couldn't. I try to get private eye. He couldn't find her. A Hollywood producer said, I've got a private eye. He'll find her. She had a twin sister. Oh, that's good. That's a good lead. But girls get married. They change their name. Hard to find. He couldn't find it. Published the book. No Denise Daly. About seven, eight months after I published that edition of a Latvian private eye who likes the UFO said, I bet you I could find her. It's good. Try it. And he found a Denise Daly with a twin sister living. I'm not going to give you the, their married names or anything, but I wrote to them. Yes, I remember you. You were my teacher, but I don't remember this material that you talk about. Um, neither does my sister. I have no idea what you're talking about. What did your father do? He worked in the automotive industry. Dead end. Okay. So where do we go? Well, I have a PhD in psychology and I teach psychological stuff, but I also taught research methods and statistics. So I'm not a stranger to scientific research. So I decided to write to a hundred scientists, physicists, chemists, uh, material scientists, and I asked them, what was I holding in my hands in 1965? Well, 41 scientists replied, and 50% of those said, I have no idea. There was no such material in existence that we know of that you were holding in your hands in 1965. And then I also said, well, take a guess. What could I have been holding? And I didn't mention anything about Roswell or UFOs. All right. So they said, well, it could be nitinol, it could be mylar, it could be hytrel, it could be capton, it could be kevlar. <coughs> mylar crinkles, and it doesn't have shape memory. It doesn't remember what it, its flatness. Nitinol is close, but it's too thick, it's too brittle. It, uh, its shape memory is only, not at room temperature. Shape memory means the material goes back to its original shape at room temperature. Nothing. Not in 2020. I bought all these things, or most of these things. Nothing. Shook. I tell. I'm. Ugh, if you're watching this video and you're a cynic about UFOs, go and find me that material, and uh, I'd love to see it. Not in 20. It would agree. But do you think? Just think about what a gr a great shirt it would be. It would be lightweight. Never would crease. Wouldn't have to iron it. Raincoat. You could. Uh, cover a car with it, would never scratch. So here are some other accounts of Roswell witnesses. It could not be torn or cut at all. It was extremely lightweight, about four or five inches square. That is exactly what I had at my teacher's desk in 1965. A sort of aluminum-like foil, most of it was kind of double-sided material. Foil like on one side, rubber like on the other. Both sides were grayish, silvery in color, more silvery than rubber. The foil rubber material could not be torn. Right on. Exactly what happened to me. You could take that stuff and wad it up and it would straighten itself out. That was an affidavit cited in 1998 by a guy who was talking about something in 1947. He was afraid to talk, but as he was reaching his death, I suppose, he wrote an affidavit. So did a few other people. Perhaps a luminized cloth. Good description. That was an affidavit signed in 1993 about a memory he had in 1947.
It was interesting. I did get to handle the material. And the material had some peculiar properties. For instance, it looked like Hershey bar wrappings. And, but you squeeze it up in your hand as hard as you could, let go, and it returned originally to the original shape instantly. Then the next day, Jesse brought some of the stuff into the intelligence office. And uh, so we looked at it and played with it a while, and then everybody went back to work. Later that day, boom, nobody knows anything. You just shut up, nothing happened, uh, et cetera. And when you're in the service, you do what they say to do. So in the first edition of this book, I had something like 32 people that I had gathered from all the UFO literature. Okay, but since then, I, I discovered some people on my own and with the uh, assistance of Tony Braglia, Bragalia, I always mispronounce his name, one of the best UFO researchers in existence, uh, we together discovered uh, a, a, another group of people. And so to the, here's a table. It goes on and it goes on. And I have quite a few of these tables. And the total now is 46 people that I have identified all the way even in 1977 who touched this material. Okay, There are apparently 10 specimens, some of which are not in the possession of the Air Force. I have no idea how this kid in my class came in possession of it. Okay, I, It would just be complete conjecture. Whoever Denise Daly was or whoever, I have no idea. So let's continue now studying Roswell. Let's go out and expand out. So uh, as you, most of you know this story, uh, the, there was the newspaper story about Roswell uh, and uh, in the course of my research, I uh, came across quite a number of people. In fact, in my book, there are 78 witnesses to either the foil or the crash or the bodies or the placement of the bodies at Wright-Patterson. So we have a total of 78 witnesses in history. Here are a few more. And as uh, Chairman Collins said, he was a mortuary officer at the base. You needed some information. I said, what do you need? And he said, uh, how many uh, hermetically sealed infant caskets do you have? Three and a half, four foot in stock. And I said, we don't have any. How long would it take you to get them? And I said, well, I can call Amarillo at 10, by 3.30 this afternoon and have them in here in the morning. I said, what's going on? He said, that's not important. I said, well, it is important. Also. And then he uh, called back later and he said, uh, I need more information. And uh, you want to know what embalming chemicals that would alter the tissue, the stomach contents, and what is our preparation for uh, taking care of bodies that are laying out in the elements for several days? And I said, you're the mortuary officer, and you're asking. I told the, the, the newspapers, I mean the newsmen, what it was, and to forget about it. It was nothing more than a well, the observation balloon, of course, which we, we both knew differently. Major Marcel had to keep silent because of his strategic position at that time. He was in charge of all security and intelligence on atomic tests in the United States and the Pacific. It was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of, because I was being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about every, all materials used in aircraft and in our air travel. This is nothing like that. It could not be, it, it could not have been. Uh, my father was in the Air Force, and he was stationed here at Roswell at the time uh, in 47. Uh, he was assigned as part of the cleanup crew out at the site. He had the highest security clearance that the Air Force gives, but uh, he was never able, nor did he ever attempt to discuss the incident.
He passed away in 1988. He had uh, his last tour of duty was in Vietnam, where he acquired Agent Orange. Ended up with a uh, cancer of the spine. He did not want to die at home. He wanted to die in a military hospital. And as he was laying on the gurney waiting to be loaded into the ambulance, he told me, he said, baby, he said, the story is true. He said, don't let anybody try to tell you any different. He said, the incident happened. There was a spacecraft. And I kissed him, and that's the last I got to talk to my dad. So uh, now we're going to move from Roswell to UFOs. We're going like from chapter to chapter to chapter in this overview that I'm giving you. For U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Robert M. Jacobs. Listen to this. For 30 years, I've held that image in my mind. What I saw was a circular object that looked like two ply pie plates put on top of each other with a golf ball on top. It was a classic flying saucer, and it shot a beam of something at our warhead. He's flying a strategic air command bomber. Okay, this is not a crazy person who's talking. From Lord Dowling, from the Royal Air Force, I'm convinced that these objects do exist and that they are not manufactured by any nation on Earth. I can therefore see no alternative to accepting the theory that they came from some extraterrestrial source. Okay, now I'm collecting this information, but I have a cynical mind or um, I have an, an object, a need to be uh, objective and critical and do my due diligence. So I get in touch with James Oberg. He is a debunker. <laughs> Everything is wrong. It's all lies. It, it's all uh, make-believe. It's all wish fulfillment. These people are whatever. So it's very difficult talking to him. I emailed him a couple times, and if you're a little bit agnostic or you show that you might have a belief in UFOs, wow, the exchange was not kind. But I decided I'm going to continue with this guy. I want to learn from him. What does he have to say? So maybe 15 emails back and forth. And we had a little bit of a detente there. And uh, I said, well, tell me. I, I want to write a book that is not doesn't have BS in it. So uh, he said, well, take a look. Neil Armstrong on the Internet. They say Neil Armstrong lands on the moon. And he said, there were UFOs there. These babies were huge, sir, enormous. Oh, God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. That's all over the Internet. Oberg says he never said that. Okay, those are misquotes. you got to pay attention. James Lovell said we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high. It's all over the Internet. Never said it or didn't mean it. So... I showed Oberg some of my witnesses, some of my cosmonauts. He said, not that, not that one, not that one, not that one. So I started winnowing down how many witnesses I had. But then I discovered, <coughs> after learning from Oberg, wait a second, there are people on YouTube who say things in their own words. So you can't say they were misquoted. There's Robert Porter, who was a flight crew member who flew the bodies uh, out of Roswell. Okay, there's uh, Gordon Cooper in his own words who chased the UFO fighting a, uh, flying a fighter aircraft, a Russian, a cosmonaut, a, a, a Russian general. Here is a pilot. Passenger, I don't know. Don't you, know. you weren't the only person who saw no, this phenomenon, what, right. were you? There, no. there, there were some passengers who saw it and yeah. also another pilot. Yes. Simultaneously. Well, look, let's, we've got an artist's impression that we knocked up here this afternoon on our, our computer paint box. Um, is that kind of what you saw? Is that a uh, reasonable... No. <laughs> oh, well, we, the best we did. I'll be you, honest, yeah. you, Well, hold that picture. Well, you, 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 you describe it. it well, it was a, a brilliant uh, yellow object. The, the brightness you've got there, about two-thirds from left to right, um, 
you know, it was a graphite grey uh, section, if you want to call it a fuselage. We don't know yet what it was. Or we're looking into it. And how big was it? Uh, difficult to say once again, but I saw it from 50 miles away. So um, any object from 50 miles away must have been fairly enormous. Well, what about a mile long? It's possible. Yeah, Did it it's, move at all? It probably didn't move, but uh, there, I had uh, the great opportunity the other day from Jersey Air Traffic Control of uh, visiting their radar uh, room and uh, some interesting... Um, traces, let's put it that way, from, from the radar, uh, really? indicate that there's a possibility that they did pick up on, from both Guernsey and Jersey radar uh, traces, uh, spurious traces they call, um, for around about 55 minutes. How long uh, did you see it for? I saw it in total for 12 minutes. Can I show you? Okay. So, um, now, I'm looking for good witnesses uh, and important witnesses and expert witnesses, and I'm gathering this data. And I'm saying to myself, you know, this is the biggest story of my life if this is true. And if it's false, then let's find out if it's false, too. Barry Goldwater was a, a very powerful senator who approved the budget of the Pentagon, okay? And he was also a major general in the Air Force Reserve, and he had a fascination for UFOs. But I think that uh, at Wright Patterson Field, if you could get into certain places, you find out what the Air Force and the government knows about UFOs. Reportedly, a spaceship landed. It was all hushed up, quieted, and nobody ever, have never heard about much of it. I called Curtis LeMay and I said, General, uh, I know we have a room at Wright-Patterson where you put all this secret stuff could I go in there? I've never heard him get mad, but he got madder than hell at me, cussed me out, said, don't ever ask me that question again. <laughs> Thou dost protest too much. So uh, in the course of my journey, I wanted to keep, capture the best UFO stories. There, are, I mean, you can go to this book or that book, best UFO stories. To me, as a researcher, the best UFO stories are those that are corroborated. If two people saw it, that's great. If 200 people saw it, that's a lot better. So co co corroboration is important. So I have a list, and I've expanded that list since the last edition of that book. Roswell is certainly there. Iceland, Montana, Kinross, Zimbabwe. Ooh, I want to give you two stories from this chapter uh, just to illustrate uh, what kind of thing I'm going for. This is Iceland, 1951. A guy, a pilot, has a number of passengers, but he also has a number of other pilots who are, vis who are taking a trip, uh, getting a free ride, as it were, from Iceland to Newfoundland. And they're flying across the ocean. The pilot looks down, he says, there's a city down there, there are lights all over. He said, are we off course? And uh, all of a sudden the lights go off in what looked like a city, underwater. And uh, I'm going to let him finish telling this story. Or maybe the tip of Greenland. So he said, no, we were right on course. So we watched it for a while, and we were drifting to the right of it. I would say we were at 10,000 feet. I would say it was 40 miles away originally, in the end of the scene, 40 miles away. When we were about uh, 25 or 30 miles away, we could see defined lights, and it was a pattern on the water. So with that pattern, we couldn't figure out what was going on. Maybe the Navy was doing something uh, that was highly classified, recovering something out in the ocean or something of this nature. So that was our thoughts. And, and uh, it was a circular pattern, and it was very large. I mean, just uh, it's, uh, I couldn't estimate the size of it. So I sent the, uh, the crew chief back to get the plane, other plane commander, Al Jones, because they wanted to land at Argentia. So when the crew was coming up from back half, there were 31 passengers, and, and, and we had two VP crews, which had pilots also, and a patrol plane pilots. And uh, at the time that they came forward, the lights went out on the water. There was nothing on the water. This is about 15 miles away. I mean, it was just dark. Now, standing behind me was the navigator, the radioman, and also the plane captain, plus them. The cockpit was full, and there were heads all over the place. And, and all of a sudden, we saw 
on the water a yellow halo that was very, very small, about 15 miles away. And it came up to 10,000 feet like that, that a fraction of a second. And I thought it was going to go right through us. And I disengaged the autopilot, push your nose over, because I was going to go under it at the angle it was coming toward me. So what happened, the minute that I did that, it was up at our altitude, and I could see nothing outside of the cockpit but this craft. And and uh, and uh, so I didn't know which way to go. And then all of a sudden I heard a racket. I didn't know what it was. I said, Fred, what the hell was that? He he looked around. And he says, Oh, he said everyone was ducking in the back of us, and they collided, and they're all laying on the deck, <laughs> deck back there, scrambling on the deck. So when I looked back, it wasn't there. And he says, It's over here on the right hand side. Now it was about a, a mile or so away on the right hand side, and it kind of drifted forward, maybe to a position maybe five miles away. And that's where it stayed with us for quite some time. This is when we could first see it wasn't above our, our altitude. It was below our altitude, but it was still above the horizon where you could see the side of the craft. You could see the dome, and you could see the color around the, the, the perimeter of the craft. And l then we knew that it was a friendly encounter. We knew it knew we were there. We knew it came out to see us, and, but we didn't think at that time that the reason it did it did this is because they wanted to show us what the Icelanders were talking about. So we we watched it for a while. So I decided I would go back there to see how the passengers reacted and also talk to the doctor that was back there. He used to make the trip over there. He had a daughter going to school in London. And and uh, so I went to him first. I said, Doc, did you uh, see what we saw? And he says, yeah. He says, he looked me straight in the eye. He says, yeah. He says, it was a flying saucer. He says, I didn't look at it because I don't believe in such things. Well, I, it took me a couple of seconds to recognize it. He couldn't believe being a psychiatrist. So, now the reason I included this story was because this document uh, was uh, a report that was uh, obtained, I think, through Freedom of Information. And it shows seven officers on that plane signed this document saying that this event happened. So I consider these people expert witnesses. They're not just passengers on the aircraft. They're pilots who are trained, and seven people said they saw a flying saucer right outside the window of their airplane. That, to me, is good evidence. Now, there's another kind of evidence, which is, strangely enough, I call it negative evidence, for lack of a better word. It's like if you protest and you say it didn't happen and you say it just a little too much, the, the negative evidence, the efforts to conceal, uh, say something about the reality of what you're attempting to conceal. Okay, uh, for, uh, maybe I haven't explained this well, but uh, the examples will explain it. Project Blue Book, all right? This was a major document. Everybody cites it. They say 10,000 sightings were documented. And they all turned out to be false. So there were a few that were ambiguous, but the head of that was a professor from OSU, Ohio State University, named Alan Hynek. He was director of Project Blue Book, which published the findings. <clears throat> and four years after the project was, was published, he said he was paid to engage in disinformation. He wasn't paid to investigate UFO sightings. He said Project Blue Book was a scientific pretense and that's the guy who headed Project Blue Book. There were, and he later became uh, quite famous as a UFO devotee. Now there were other projects, few people ever heard about Project Garnet, Gleam, Magnet, Moondust, Pounce, all investigating UFOs, none of which got any <clears throat> airing in American public consciousness. Now, uh, Stephen Colbert interviews Obama Listen carefully to what Obama says. <laughs> okay, think negative evidence and think about what this means. Prying information out of uh, the bowels of an agency. It's two weeks ago. Uh, can, can be challenging. UFOs? Any UFOs? Did you ask about that? I certainly asked about it. And? Can't tell you. Sorry. Okay. All right, I'll take that as a yes. Because <laughs> if there were none, Why you'd not? say there was none, right? <laughs> you just played your hand. I thought you were a poker player. You just want to 100% show your river card. Feel, feel free to think that. I do. <laughs> <coughs> okay. That was uh, as he was promoting his book. So the correct answer, Mr. Obama, President Obama, is if you say you looked, 
Uh, I didn't find anything. That's the correct answer. When you say, I can't tell you, that's the same as saying, well, there is something there, isn't there? So here's a story of uh, Bent Waters. I actually taught uh, college for as a civilian for the Air Force at Bent Waters in England, uh, the largest nuclear base in England. And before that time, or maybe after, I forget, I think it's after, uh, they had a UFO sighting. And uh, for three days, and they, the Air Force denied it, said there were no audio tapes made. Um, uh, sorry, folks, you're just um, making this up. Someone obtained a Freedom of Information Act document signed by the base commander, Colonel Halt, which said there was a UFO uh, sighting, and it was very brief, but they found the document that proved the Air Force had been lying about saying there were no documents, nothing was found, no tapes made. And then later, Colonel Halt retires from the Air Force, comes out and talks about the incident. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Charles I. Halt. I retired from the U.S. Air Force in 1991 as a colonel. During my military career, I was base commander of two large installations, and at the time of my retirement, I was as a deputy base commander. At that time, Bent Waters was one of the largest tactical fighter wings in the world. We had the two base complex, Woodbridge and Bent Waters in England. And in December 1980, in the, early in the morning, several of our security policemen discovered strange lights in the forest in East Anglia, just outside the back, and approached the craft. They reported it being triangular, approximately three meters on a side, dark metallic in appearance, with strange markings. They observed it for a period of time, and it very quickly and silently vanished at high speed. Initially, I was not aware of all the details. I was only told of strange lights, and I was sure there was a logical explanation. Two nights later at the family Christmas party, we were interrupted. The on-duty flight commander for the security police squadron, Lieutenant Bruce England, came and approached the base commander and I. He was white as a sheet. He said, it's back. He said, what's back? He said, the UFO. Well, we still were, I should say, non-believers at that point. Since my boss had to do the presentations, I was tasked, unfortunately, to investigate. So I went home and changed clothes. I really expected to find a logical explanation. I took several security policemen with me, a disaster preparedness NCO who took an APN-27, a Geiger counter, and a camera. I also had my small cassette recorder I carried everywhere when I was on duty. Uh, I was taken to the supposed site. We find indentations approximately an inch and a half deep, approximately six to eight feet on a side, and radiation of eight to nine times normal background radiation. Not enough to be dangerous to somebody, but significant. We also find broken branches on the trees. While we were milling around trying to make sense of the whole thing, one of the individuals with me suddenly spotted something. Off through the forest was a bright, glowing object. The best way I can describe it, it looked like an eye. It was bright red with a dark center. It appeared to be winking. It would sort of wink. It was shedding something like molten metal. It was dripping off it. It silently moved through the trees, avoiding any contact. It bobbed up and down. And at one point, it actually approached us. We tried to get closer. It receded out into the field, beyond the forest, and silently exploded into five white objects. Gone. So we went out into the field looking for any evidence, because something had apparently been falling off it, and we'd, we found nothing. But while we were searching around in the field, one of the people with me noticed some objects in the sky to the north. There were three or four objects in the north, brightly colored, changing from elliptical to round, and moving at very high speed and sharp angular movements as though they were doing a grid search. While we were watching them, somebody else noticed to the south there were two objects just sort of hovering in the sky. One object approached us at very high speed, best guess is three to 5,000 feet, somewhere in that neighborhood, stopped directly overhead and sent down a concentrated beam at our feet. It was about one foot in diameter. The best way I can equate it is sort of a laser beam. We stood there in awe. Was this a warning? Was this an attempt to communicate? Was this a weapon or just a probe? Just as suddenly as it appeared, 
click, it disappeared. We stood there, ah, oh, really concerned. This is a uh, United States Air Force Colonel, base commander. Okay, I consider him an expert witness, and I have quite a few of those. Now, here's a new story that was not in my other video. Uh, stunning. It comes from the movie The Phenomenon. And uh, again, I like this evidence because the kind of corroboration is very strange. This is an upscale school, diverse, in Zimbabwe, uh, the REL school. And the teachers are letting the children out for lunch break. They go on the playground. The teachers gather together in the lunchroom for a faculty meeting. Uh, the children see a UFO flying around, and then the UFO lands, and 62 children ran towards the UFO. And it was uh, all of a sudden a, be a, a being appears at the top of the UFO and sort of floats down to the ground, wearing a black suit, having large almond eyes, and this little girl, Selma Sedek, was about five feet away from this being. Other children felt that they had been put into some kind of a telepathic uh, trance where they were told that uh, tech, our technology is destroying the planet. Okay, now that's what that's the story that was told by the children who came running back after a, a few, I don't know how long this lasted. And the teacher said initially didn't believe them, and then there were so many children, they started to believe them, had them draw pictures. And finally, people came, a, a noted Harvard psychiatrist came, interviewed the children. Now, I'm going to show you two videos. What is interesting is this little girl, Selma Sadek, is one of uh, the 62. She's talking when she's 11 years old, but then she's invited 20, 19 years later at the age of 30 to tell us whether uh, what she saw again and she totally corroborates what she said when she was 11 and so did a number of other witnesses this is quite interesting here the log yeah and then we saw something shiny so we all ran down over there and it was in the early morning it was at bright time yeah and then we saw something shiny and we saw two two people they were in black tight black suits and they had big eyes and a small, you didn't actually see their nose, they were quite small and their mouth was quite small as well. One of them was running in slow motion up across the ship and the other one was standing beside the ship. Yeah, you made some drawing, huh? You really look like this? No, yeah, yeah, something like that. I couldn't see the eyes or the nose or the mouth, it was just blank. So. That's the little children. Uh, now, 19 years later, the people who produce this movie invite these some of these people who they had traveled all over the world. And here she is, the same girl now, but she is a woman, and she is uh, reflecting on the same experience. A, the closest thing I can describe it as is being in like a, a scuba diving suit, which I think hmm. is what I described it as when I was 11, because that was what I knew. Um, that was like the closest thing I could relate it to, but I have, I don't recall it being, it did not have any hair, no facial hair, no hair in its head, nothing. Almost, skin was almost like porcelain, really. Really, and was it like, almost like a, a white color? Yes, well. Like porcelain white? Yeah, like, like, por like, yes, almost like a, like a nude kind of porcelain kind of color is what I could is what I could best describe it. I think I said porcelain in that it just looked completely perfect. There was mm. no blemish, there was no nothing. It just was so smooth and it almost looked um yeah I think porcelain is just it's very it's very firm, it's stiff, it's kind of stoic like. So if you mm. were to think of a, a statue, you know, I'd be like, okay, it's kind of like a porcelain statue. Um oh. except that this this being was moving um but it was there was no, you know, the expression on on its face was not one that I really understood. There was no smile. There was no frown. You know, there were not um, facial. There was no facial recognition. Okay, so uh, that that represents a, to me very stark, interesting evidence. Now, as I'm collecting evidence, note, I'm looking for 
having learned from James Oberg, I'm not just going to take testimony. There are 10,000 people who saw the Phoenix Lights. I only found 72 testimonies with videotape in their own words kind of things. 13,000 people said they saw the Belgian UFOs. I didn't include that data. Uh, 3,500 pilots have reported UFOs, but always anonymously. I didn't include that data. 7,500 people saw the UFOs over the Indian Valley area. I didn't include that. If it's anonymous, if it's not personal. So what I ended up with was a database of 254 witnesses from the general public who signed affidavits, said things, are on videotape, relatives, whatever, and I mean relatives who possess these affidavits, and 250 expert witnesses. So here's here's the general public, and uh, this is what these are kinds of things that are quoted in my book. The aircrafts were the size of aircraft carriers. It was so close you could hit it with a tennis ball. It was the size of several football fields. I watched it for over 20 minutes. It blocked out the sky. It hovered. It took off at tremendous speeds. I was looking at it less than 100 yards from my disabled car. One big, large boomerang. I said to my wife, it must be a mile long. Now, in addition, I had those pilots from Iceland and all these are ra radar operators and pilots and astronauts and cosmonauts and generals, okay? 250 experts. Here's what they say. We airbrushed out pictures and shadows of UFOs before releasing pictures to the public. I've flown 747s and never seen anything like it. We saw it for 55 minutes. The thing was as large as an aircraft carrier. We tracked it on radar and had it targeted when it flew to 10,000 feet and then back down to 500 within seconds. I'm not going to read all of this. I'll come down to the end. It shut down 10 ICBMs within seconds. It was metallic, silver, and saucer shaped. Now, I would like to and uh, underscore something. We have 254 members of the general public, 250 expert witnesses. 92 of these testimonials are YouTube videos in their own words. That's 504 witnesses. Now, I want to take you on a guided fantasy. We've had some congressional hearings in the United States that really got a lot of attention. The Kefauver hearings in the 1950s, uh, the Kennedy assassination, the Warren Commission hearings, and the, um, and, the, uh, and the Watergate hearings. Now, during the Watergate hearings, there were 60 witnesses who were called, and it ended up in the resignation of the President of the United States, right? Now, imagine that we actually have a hearing, an uh, open, honest, transparent hearing in the Congress and Senate of the United States, where we not call we don't call sixty witnesses, we call five hundred and four witnesses. That's eight times, and they make their statements, and we bring in the debunkers too. Okay, I believe, in my heart of hearts, this is the conclusion of that committee. If we did, if we had the courage to do it, this is what the the conclusion would be. It is the conclusion of this committee that extraterrestrial visitations of Earth have occurred, and our planet has and continues to be visited by what appears to be a benevolent alien civilization. I believe, truly, that an open hearing would result in that conclusion, from the evidence that I present in my book and that I have gathered. Okay. 504 people are not crazy, especially when 250 of them are uh, storied officers and uh, highly trained people, so including scientists. Now, we've, before we get to the next part of this talk, I wanted to show you a couple videos of YouTube uh, uh, of, of UFOs. I don't know if these are real. I've asked a few people who are uh, very skeptical. Do you think this is authentic? And uh, this one uh, passed through that filter. Uh, I, we know you don't know ever for sure, but I thought I would pass this on. The next one I want to show you is uh, a UFO in 1989 in Belgium. A lot, Belgium. A lot of people uh, photograph this as triangular shaped, uh, and so that's what 40 years old. But 
three weeks ago, the Pentagon released uh, emails. I want to just read this as it is. This is December 5th, 2020. Listen carefully. Pentagon released email shows a photo from 2019 from inside the cockpit of a military fighter jet depicting an apparent aerospace vehicle described as a large equilateral triangle with rounded or blunted edges and large perfectly spherical white lights in each corner, according to debrief.org. Well, that 2020 release is very, very similar to this 1989 UFO. Okay, interesting. Frosting on the cake is next. This is a 2017 encounter over San Diego uh, near an aircraft carrier. Fighter jets are sent up, checking it out. And these are, uh, now this is released in 2020, but uh, this is a Pentagon release, believe take us to part two of this talk, which I consider to be more important than the first part. We usually read a UFO book and say, oh my God, UFOs, could they be real? But we don't think through, what does it mean if human beings have come in contact with extraterrestrial civilizations? I mean, how does that change history, ancient history, archaeology, biology, science? Our most serious-minded people don't believe any of this. So this is what we're going to explore in the book next. So take a look. This is in mythology. This is a list of all the sky gods that I could find. Jesus is there. Horus is there. Uh, Odin is there. Zeus is there. These are all allegedly mythological uh, examples of human fantasy. Oh, really? What if they're not? What if they actually were entities that visited uh, humanity and were given names? So from the Bible, and when we had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. What if that actually happened? And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Whoa, sounds like an abduction. It came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Whoa. Now we start reading the Bible differently, don't we? Now let's, let's read Ezekiel differently. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. When the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Whenever, wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. Okay, so 
cultures from American and uh, Native American cultures to Africa to Mesopotamia have stories of gods who were benevolent and who taught human beings written language, smelting, how to use a compass. You know, we celebrate Eli Whitney and Thomas Edison and Steve Jobs and Elon Musk as the great inventors. The Sumerians didn't do that. They attributed all their advancements to the gods. We have 26 sky gods who tutored human beings. Check the book out. It's a very interesting section. Now, as a psychologist, there is a template I think we need to be aware of, the template of John Frum. So there was a pilot named John who uh, flew a Cessna uh, into the Caroline Islands in World War II. And uh, uh, he said he was from California. Well, the natives had never seen a plane before, and they, in effect, saw John Frum as a god. They called him John Frum. They celebrate the John Frum Day on February 13th every year, and they make a an artificial runway, a replica of his aircraft. They believe that uh, John Frum is a god and that he was uh, the second coming of John Frum will be uh, when he brings them concrete houses and uh, foodstuffs. He brought a few things with him the first time. So they stay up all night. They keep a vigil. Uh, they have religious services, uh, and it's called the cargo cult of the Caroline Islands. Okay? And they're waiting for their Messiah. The question is, did we deify ancient travelers with who had superior technology and turn them into gods as well, in the same way that the John from Cargo Cult has uh, commemorated his coming? Is that how primitive people react to individuals or entities with um, uh, superior technology? This is something that would be outside the realm of uh, the study of mythology. But it is a, a legitimate question worth asking if we accept the idea that UFOs may in fact be real. Let's take a look at archaeology and how it is transferred. Let's take a thousand archaeologists. And you're not going to investigate those issues if you start thinking that those rock paintings are describing creatures that came from outer space. No, no, they have to be seen as only um, hallucinations or peyote kinds of expressions from primitive peoples. Not that these primitive peoples were attempting to describe beings who visited them from other places. This is a cave in India uh, uh, that looks just like the uh, what Salma said. Uh, said. You remember the UFO with that Colonel Halt talked about with the hot metal fl flaking off of it? Well, there's an Indian painting doing something similar. And I tried to vet it as best I could, and I had trouble. But I did find that a guy named Wasim Khan discovered it. He's an archaeologist, has a PhD. I asked him a few questions. I didn't get the kind of answers I wanted. I wanted to know if they've ever dated that painting. But, uh, but I think it's, it's close to being vetted by me anyway. So I made trips to the Nazca Lines. I went to China. I visited uh, Egypt, climbed inside the Great Pyramid. Here are some things about the Great Pyramid that are mysteries. It was made, allegedly built around 2600 BC. Now Archimedes discovered Pi in 250 BC, but Pi is found 2,200 years earlier in the Great Pyramid. If you multiply the height of the Great Pyramid, 146.75 meters by 1 million, the result is approximately equal to the distance from the Earth to the Sun. The weight of the Great Pyramid 5,273,000 tons, 
multiplied by a billion equals the weight of the earth. If you divide the perimeter of the pyramid by one half its height, the result is 3.14, the famous Greek number pi, the ratio between the circumference of a circle and its radius, which would be... So, uh, <clears throat> let's take a look a, uh, at some more. I guess you'd call it forbidden archaeology. So, a civil engineer takes his children uh, camping and they camp near the Great Pyramid. And he's a civil engineer from Saudi Arabia, and he notices that the dog-leggedness of the pyramid plain in Giza is very analogous to Orion's belt. And he carries out his measurements, and he said, oh my God, the angle of deflection is the same. Well, since the time of that, others have spoken about it. Here's a quantum physicist. Egyptologists have often asked the question, why did the ancient Egyptians build three great pyramids that are slightly misaligned? Did they have bad ruler sticks thousands of years ago? The three pyramids seem to be aligned to the three constellation stars of Orion. What does this alignment mean? Was it a coincidence? Or were the pyramids intentionally engineered this way? It has been claimed that the layout of the three major pyramids on the Giza Plateau, including the Great Pyramid, are set on the ground to mimic the three stars in Orion's belt. Now, if we add in the Chinese pyramid plane, these are made out of dirt. The largest is called the White Pyramid in China. And you do your measurements, it comes out to approximately the same uh, degree of arc of dog-leggedness as the belt of Orion. Now here we have a culture in 2600 BC and when those Chinese pyramids are built is up to we don't know. We, we still don't think that the Egyptians had much contact with the Chinese way back then. Uh, now if we add in Teotihuacan in Mexico we see the same issue. Okay we have three different locations on the planet and that same pattern that is visible in the night sky. Now there's another discovery that I made. I mean, I didn't make it, but I observed it uh, from a, a book that was written by a fellow who said there's a, a henge, it's called the Thornboro Henge in England, which is dated at 3500 BC. That's a thousand years before the Great Pyramid, also a line to Orion four different locations in four disparate cultures at four different time periods. Very strange. So let's uh, end the archaeological expedition by a saying that uh, if UFOs exist, our understanding of archaeology um, is going to change and we're going to start looking at things differently. And probably we're very overdue for that. Now we have to take a look at biological implications. And my mentor, uh, uh, the person who influenced me the most, was Carl Jung. Sigmund Freud would look at a dream as if it was some kind of deception and a trickery. And Jung said, yeah, okay, but sometimes you need to just look at a dream for what it is and then ask, what am I looking at? Now, if you just look at this, Dreams and myths he considered similarly, so did Joseph Campbell. So let's take a look. This is a picture of the nativity, right? You're, what are you actually looking at? Well, you're looking at something that 33% of the human race looks at and commemorates in a religious ritual every December 25th, the birth of a child to a mother who is from this earth, but the father was from another planet, from another place, the heavenly father. Okay, And Christ is called the new man, a hybrid, half God, half man. Okay, That is what we're celebrating or commemorating or memorializing. So there is a pervasive mythology in history that the gods consorted with humans, Zeus, the Greeks, they mated with human beings, or they interacted or tweaked our, our genome in some way, or tutored us. And that is a very, very pervasive mythology. Now, if you are an assistant professor of evolutionary biology and you want to pursue that, goodbye. You're not getting tenure. Okay, this is not how we're going to do 
uh, the study of evolution. So let, in, in this video, we're going to raise that issue. So we, how we were taught how old are human Homo sapiens, we were taught they were 50,000 years old when we were in high school. Well, that's not true. Uh, the actual age is at least 196,000 years, 200,000 years for a biologically modern human being, Homo sapiens sapien. Okay. See the book for, for the science behind that. That's not conjecture anymore. So uh, using that yardstick, we noticed something. Our cultural evolution vastly differs from our physical evolution. We were here for 200,000 years, but it took us until the 94th percentile of our existence on this planet before we developed a bow and arrow. Okay, Our first civilization was in the 96th percentile of our existence here. We codified our first written language late, late, late. We were late bloomers. So why does our cultural evolution differ so much from our physical evolution. It took 190,000 years before we got the idea of domesticating a goat. Really, 191,000 years before we said, hey, let's domesticate a pig. 194,500 years before we codified our first written language. Why were we so slow? Or another way to put it, how come we got so smart so quickly. All right. Now, the traditional explanations, there are two or three. Uh, one is that our frontal lobes got bigger. That's not true. Scientists have looked at the ratio of the frontal lobes in all sorts of primates, and our ratio does not significantly differ, and there has not, no, not been a major change in the size of our frontal lobes in 200,000 years. Number two, and this is, uh, this is probably the mainstream point of view, that the Ice Age uh, made farming impossible. And that's the picture of the Ice Age at its maximum. Now, when the Ice Age receded 11,000 years ago, then farming became possible and the human growth of human civilization took off. Okay, that's the traditional explanation. But the Ice Ages came and went. It wasn't uh, an Ice Age for 190,000 years, okay? It fluctuated. And there were plenty of areas in East Asia, Africa, and Central America where you could have had agriculture. Chimpanzees continued to eat fr fruits and dates and apples for five million years. Why didn't Homo sapiens say, let's domesticate some animals, let's plant some uh, grains? Not until uh, the last 10,000 years. Now, there's one book that I like that I think offers a non-ancient alien approach. It says this, that the 10,000 year explosion, he's trying to explain that. Human beings, the Ice Age recedes, population increases, as population increases, genetic diversity increases. As genetic diversity increases, our intelligence flourishes. So that's one alternate explanation for how we got so smart so quickly. But there's another explanation that is always ignored, and that is what our ancient forefathers have been telling us. The Book of Enoch, the Pyramid Texts, the Japanese Nihongi, the Mayan Popo Vu, the Greek Hesiod's Theogony, in Persia, in China, in Sumeria, in India, in Babylonia, in uh, Mexico, in Ethiopia, they're all saying we were visited by heavenly creatures who influenced us, who bred with us, who married our daughters, who had children by us, who experimented with us. The Sumerians talk about that. Okay. And that's what we have to ignore in academia. It's all fantasy. So our question in this video is, well, did our genes change? Were we edited? Were we manipulated? Were, did something happen really recently? 
uh, that would have made us this smart so quickly. There are two examples. One is the thing called Mungo Man, who was discovered in Australia, and another was a creature, human, modern, Homo sapien, found in Bulgaria, in Bacho Kiro. The Mungo Man specimen is dated at 42,000 years, and his DNA is different than ours, significantly different. But people say, now that's contaminated. Okay, another specimen in Bacho Kuro, 40, they, this is the earliest DNA we have ever found, human DNA, and it also differs from our present DNA. So we have changed, in Darwinian terms, that's rapidly. Something has changed our DNA in a very, very short period of time. Now, there are two approaches to why we got so smart and our genes changed so quickly. One is mutations caused by rapidly increasing population. Sounds good. The other is the mythological, that we were visited by uh, alien uh, beings of some sort who uh, changed us, who interacted with us, who uh, interbred with us. And that's a hypothesis that could be scientifically studied, actually. Okay, But it isn't looked at with any seriousness. So evolutionary biology changes if we accept that UFOs are real, and it's a new paradigm in academic thinking. Now there's another idea, and that is maybe we're receiving messages and we're ignoring them because of our biases. These are very abstract figures, and we uh, the academic world says, oh no, they're all made by humans, they're all made by trespassers, they're all made by people who are hoaxers. Really? Why do they make the same abstract uh, forms in Kansas and France and Bulgaria and uh, England? Uh, why are they always in this kind of abstract form? Uh, are you sure all oh, crop circles are made by vandals? Well, I um, here's a video on how one person thinks they're made by uh, what are called balls. You know, there's a couple of lights down there somewhere. This controversial film appears to show strange objects hovering above a cornfield. Below, complex circle formations appear. So uh, I wrote a book on uh, crop circles. There are at least 4,000 crop circles published that I've seen. I understood about 40, and I only understood them with the help of a number of scientists who I consulted in a very uh, discreet fashion. So I want to give you one example from that book, and uh, whether or not the, the question is, are we really receiving messages and ignoring them? Here's a crop circle in a red poppy field, very mysterious, the size of a football field. If you look closely in the middle, you can see some people standing there, okay? Now, the farmer didn't like people coming to his field, and he put up a sign and said, stay out of my field. Okay, he didn't like, it caused him a great deal of uh, damage to his, whatever he was growing. So, uh, um, Molecular biologist from Australia said, I see this crop circle is really a molecular diagram of vitamin A down to the atom, down to the electron. And it's almost exact. Okay? It's vitamin A. Now, my job as a psychologist, I, I'm not a physical scientist, but my job is motivation. Why would anyone do that? Okay, let's think that one through. So, uh, when you do a crop circle, the first thing you have to say to yourself is, I don't know enough about this subject matter, so I need to study physics or chemistry or whatever. Uh, so I had to do a little homework on vitamin A, and here's a little of that homework. Hey guys, in this video, I wanna talk about vitamin A, okay? There's some real interesting things about vitamin A. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. What does that mean? You have water-soluble vitamins and you have fat-soluble vitamins. Fat-soluble vitamins have the ability to travel through fat, to be stored in fat longer. It has the ability to go through cell walls because the layer around cells are fat lipid layers or fat layers. 
these vitamin A, um, fat soluble vitamins can go right through the cell where water soluble vitamins cannot. So they can affect the deep parts of the cell, the DNA, the alteration of the DNA, and that's why vitamin A deficiencies can really affect what your skin turns into, okay, at the genetic level. So you can have a lot of little flaking things on your skin, little um, white little dots on the, the skin, on the hair follicles. You can, it can create a lot of problems with your vision as well because vitamin A is necessary for your eye. So if you can't see at night, when you're driving at night and it's hard to see, that's a vitamin A deficiency, okay? Also, lubrication of the eye and the mouth and anything, um, any glandular secretion, if like if you don't have enough of that lubrication, that's a vitamin A deficiency. Okay, thank you. So I'm uh, saying to myself, uh, well, I'm learning a little more about vitamin A. And then I start realizing vitamin A deficiency and blindness has something to do with color blindness. Vitamin A is related to pigment perception. Vitamin A deficiency is related to color blindness. This crop circle is in the middle of a red poppy field, and it's showing us a molecular diagram of vitamin A. And it's like, duh, who came up with that idea? Now, I wanted to see, are there a lot of red poppy fields? I took a, I looked at the photographs of in the distance. I didn't see other poppy fields. I said, how long is it to... How long are poppy fields in bloom? Four to six weeks. So whoever makes this crop circle of vitamin A, who wants to put it in a red poppy field when it's blossoming, has to do it in a window of only four to six weeks. Wow. That takes practice to get those circles just right, those electrons and the oxygen molecules placed properly. It's getting more intriguing, isn't it? So, a, a little more, a deeper research. Uh, women who experienced frequent miscarriages suffered vitamin A deficiencies. Never knew that, did you? Female rats with vitamin A deficiency had difficulty getting pregnant and had embryos with birth defects. Didn't know that either. Interesting. More. Vitamin A deficiency impacts male spermatogenesis. Whoa, fertility. Vitamin A deficiency is related to higher incidence of death from measles and diarrhea. Interesting. So, back to the crop circle. We see a, a molecular description of vitamin A and then what looks like a retina. That's the best interpretation for this crop circle. Vision, color perception. So, then I thought, let's take a look at worldwide vitamin A deficiency, because otherwise, if these are aliens making a crop circle of vitamin A, what are they doing? Trying to sell us uh, vitamin supplements? But if you get more serious, you realize vitamin A deficiency affects, the, uh, affects humanity. That redness on that map refers to clinically deficient people with vitamin A deficiency. It's widespread. Okay, 250,000 to 500,000 vitamin A deficient children become blind every year, and half of them die within their first year. So let's take another slice of this. One seventh of the human race suffers from a deficiency in this micronutrient that impacts vision, intelligence, immunity, fertility, mortality. That's 14% of the human race. Well, are you getting, do you understand where we're going here? So the, the thought is, okay, who made this? That's my job. Who possibly could have made it? Well, let's think. Vandals did it. Crappies did it. Really? Okay, these are guys who, or teams, who sneak up on a field. So if you think that's the people who made it, they had a team. They had to rehearse it. It's really hard to do that, to get everything properly placed in the middle of the night when the farmer isn't looking at precisely the time that the poppies are in blossom. Why? Because these vandals care about the human race? Because they care about miscarriages? And that's why they're doing it? 
It doesn't make sense. They caused $3,000 worth of damage to that farmer's crop. Why would they do that? Okay, then how about vitamin A activists did it? People who really do care about the human race. And they put down a crop circle be to illustrate color perception, vision, blindness, its effect on human beings. Well, that makes sense. I imagine there are some vitamin A activist groups. Are there vitamin A activist groups that also make crop circles? And why would you make a molecular diagram? If you're that concerned about one, about 14% of the human race suffering, why don't you put it in English? Why don't you make a crop circle that says, help eradicate vitamin A deficiency, act now. That would, because people would pay attention to that. They're not gonna interpret a crop circle. People think all crop circles are just made by vandals. You're wasting your time. Conclusion. An extraterrestrial source made that message. Okay, uh, in this book, Messages from the Gods, which I wrote last year, um, I tried to translate these 40 crop circles in English. So what would be the translation? If this is a message from E.T., okay, dropped into a farmer's field when poppies were in blossom. Here's what it would say in English. Okay, your knowledge of vitamin A is sufficient, but your ability to deliver it is not. 14% of Homo sapiens are afflicted by this impoverishment and experience blindness, premature death, and reproductive failure because of your inability to eradicate this deficiency in your species. Thank you, E.T. A little comedy. So I want to illustrate one last item just to show you the level of bias that exists. Here's a crop circle. I, could, I, I couldn't understand it. It's way over my head. It has a mathematical progression, a level 11 dots to 12 to 14 to 18 and back and forth. And I'm not a mathematician. I'm not going to write to a math professor and tell him about a crop circle. But I show him this diagram. And I said, can you help me understand this? He said, oh my God, where did you get that? That's 11, 12, 14, 18 is a numerical sequence to minus infinity and to plus infinity. Where did you get that? I want to know where you got that from. So I thought, well, maybe I'll confide. I, I said, could you please explain that? Uh, I don't really understand what you're trying to say. He said, I'll explain it to you, but I want to know where you got that. And I said, well, I told him it came from a crop circle. If you see in the very center, there's a person standing there. This is a gigantic construction. What do you think he said to me when he learned it came from a crop circle? He was so excited. He emailed me back and said, that says it all as far as I'm concerned. And I now go into his spam folder not to be taken seriously. That's the issue. So Rupert Sheldrick is a famous biologist. He talks about the science delusion, that we are operating under some false premises. Listen to what he has to say. The science delusion is the belief that science already understands the nature of reality in principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. This is a very widespread belief in our society. It's the kind of belief system of people who say, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. It's a belief system uh, which has now been spread to the entire world. But there's a conflict in the heart of science between science as a method of inquiry based on reason, evidence, hypothesis, uh, and collective investigation, and science as a belief system or a worldview. And unfortunately, the worldview aspect of science has come to inhibit and constrict the free inquiry, which is the very lifeblood of the scientific endeavor. Since the late 19th century, uh, science has been conducted under the aspect of a belief system or worldview, which is essentially that of materialism, philosophical materialism. And the sciences are now wholly owned subsidiaries 
of the materialist worldview. I think that as we break out of it, uh, the sciences will be regenerated. What I do in my book, The Science Delusion, which is called Science Set Free in the United States, um, is take the ten dogmas or assumptions of science and turn them into questions, seeing how well they, turn, how well they stand up if you look at them scientifically. None of them stand up very well. Wow. Now, I, did, I found out his thinking. So let's take a look at scientific delusions. The sun and all the planets revolve around the Earth. The Earth is the center of the universe. This was a belief that was delusional, that w went on for hundreds of years. Copernicus, Galileo, Giordano, Bruno tried to correct the delusion. Okay? Now we have, here are UFO delusions. This is how scientists feels. There are no gods. There are no aliens who have visited Earth. All crop circles are man-made. All UFO sightings are misperceptions or lies. The pyramids were entirely man-made. All archaeological pictographs of alien-like creatures are misconstrued. There are no extraterrestrial contacts which have influenced the human genome. All mythological and historical accounts of sky gods or divine beings from Zeus to Christ to Quetzalcoatl are falsehoods, fables, and religious fantasies. Those are our contemporary delusions that are held by the smartest people in our society, in Western civilization, and in the world. Okay, so we have two stark choices. If that is correct, then contemporary, rational, educated human beings are living properly and rationally, and there are no UFOs. And all of this stuff that we've been talking about is falsehood. And you're living properly, congratulations. Okay. And Denise Daly's father probably worked in an automobile factory. And that material probably uh, exists somewhere. I haven't seen it in 55 years. But the other choice is, if that's wrong, then humanity is as deluded and misguided and in denial as it was in the days before Copernicus. We are living in the dark ages of denial without knowing it. Okay. We're insisting that uh, the Earth is the center of the universe. We're, it's just as bad as that. So Galileo was forgiven 400 years later by Pope John Paul II. Giordano Bruno still hasn't been forgiven for his heresy. So it takes a long time to get beyond a delusion. The feeling of ridicule of scorn, that you're a nutcase, that you're involved in nutty things, is ever present in anything you do related to this. And, and I'm included in that, all right? Here's what Copernicus said. Therefore, when I considered this carefully, the contempt which I had to fear because of the novelty and apparent absurdity of my view nearly induced me to be uh, utterly abandon the work that I had begun. And I think any serious UFO researcher feels exactly the same. So do we want the truth or are we afraid of the truth? 79% of the American people say the government was holding the truth about UFOs. Okay? The academic world at the same time is totally adamant in its opposition to this. In archaeology, in the biological sciences, in, in astronomy. Okay, So my conclusion from this work is that our sciences would be shaken to the core when they accept the idea that UFOs are real and what that means to archaeology, anthropology, evolutionary biology, ancient history, mythology, and probably religion and philosophy. Okay. Professor Hynek from Project Blue Book said, I believe that will prove not to be merely the next small step in the march of science, but a mighty and totally unexpected quantum jump. So we are fascinated with e aliens and with UFOs. Uh, or if we dis actually came out and said they're real, is that going to cause too much cognitive dissonance? 
And now we're coming to a very controversial conclusion of this talk, which you're, this you're going to think is somewhat unexpected. The Brookings Report was written right after Roswell. The government asked Rand Corporation what would happen if we told the American people UFOs were real. It was published in the 50s, and it said essentially, no, it's, it would not be good. It would be a bad thing. To, it would be destabilizing if people knew that. It would be destabilizing not just for our culture, but for other cultures on this planet. Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock, was interviewed. What would happen to people if they actually learned that UFOs are real? He similarly said, I don't think people are ready for it. It's going to cause too much cognitive dissonance. A National Geographic poll found 20% of Americans would be nervous and afraid if they were told UFOs really existed. So are we in denial and are we not ready for the truth? And that's the conclusion of this exercise. George Bush Sr., okay, in a wheelchair, 90-some years old, is going the, to Florida to so, support his son, Jeb Bush, who's trying to become a presidential candidate. He's wheeled onto the stage, and somebody sneaks a question that's completely inappropriate. And the question from the audience to the former president and the former head of the CIA, George Bush Sr., was, when is the government going to tell the truth about UFOs? That was the question. And this, this is what his answer is, and this is the conclusion of my talk. His answer was, Americans aren't ready for the truth. And I think that's possibly true. Thank you very much for watching. Send me your comments.